Greetings online students. It has been a while. I'm excited to be back. We just got back from Kansas and we attended a wonderful conference and I think you're going to enjoy a lot of the changes that are going to be made because of that conference. So without further ado though, I'm going to be covering some ICU content. I hope my throat does not give out. I have had that thing since we left before we left about three weeks. My throat has still got it. So if I start getting scratchy, I'll grab the bottle of water and try that. So you're going to need your med search book. And chapter 32 was a sign for you to read. And the very first part of chapter 32 covers pulmonary embolism. Now I'm not going to cover that because it is covered in respiratory extensively. So I am going to start with acute respiratory distress syndrome on page 612 of your book. So if you'll get it ready and get your handout ready, then I'll get us ready. <coughs> Excuse me. Da -da. Okay, try blowing it up a little bit here. Now Again, if you've got your book, you'll need it because I'm going to be referring to your book quite a bit here and reading some stuff from your book. I have condensed this information down considerably. So if you know what uh, information I'm telling you to know, you should be okay. So let's start with acute respiratory distress syndrome. Okay, sometimes this has also been called shock lung, S-H-O-C-K-L-U-N-G, shock lung. And it affects quite a few people, really. Uh, if you know the etiology and you don't have to know uh, the specifics uh, that's on this table I'm fixing to refer, to refer to, but just what generally causes ARDS. And usually it occurs because of some acute traumatic event. And that acute traumatic event stimulates a systemic inflammatory response. And this usually occurs in patients who've had no previous pulmonary problems. So they've got a traumatic event and all of a sudden they go into ARDS. Uh, mortality rate is 50 to 60% even with treatment. Uh, acute lung injury does lead to ARDS. So what are the causes of acute lung injury? If you look on page 613 in your book, it talks about common causes of acute lung injury on table 32-4. And if you think about it, just about anything then that ends up causing trauma can lead to ARDS if you're not careful. Anything from shock to any kind of traumatic event, pancreatitis, embolize, infection, sepsis, pulmonary aspiration. My grandmother went um, and to check into a retirement center and ended up uh, with some complications because of some things that happened and ended up in ARDS because of pulmonary aspiration. So things can happen uh, very quickly and you don't like again, usually this person has no previous pulmonary disease. It is strictly related uh, to this acute lung injury. Now the major site of injury is going to be the alveolar capillary membrane. Now normally when you think about the alveolar capillary membrane, it's permeable only to very small molecules. And that's a good thing. We don't want a whole lot of stuff going through there, do we? But what happens to that if that's the major site of injury? Then, if that's the major site of injury, not only the small molecules, but now the larger molecules are going to get through because of this change in permeability. This causes the um, interstitium of the lung to increase in fluids. And that's because protein and other cells are escaping from blood vessels into the lung tissue. And if they are escaping from the blood vessels and going into the lung tissue, because now they can cross that permeability, of course edema is going to result. Now, 
with that edema, surfactant activity is also going to be reduced. So what harm could that cause, right? Just because surfactant is decreased. Well, if you look in your book under patho, it talks about uh, the dangers of the surfactant being uh, decreased on the very bottom of page 612, starting up on the top of 613. It says surfactant activity is reduced in arts because type 2 pneumocytes are damaged and because the surfactant is diluted by excess fluid, lung fluids. As a result, the alveoli become unstable and tend to collapse unless they are filled with fluid. These fluid filled these fluid filled and collapsed alveoli cannot participate in gas exchange. Oops, I see a problem, Houston. As a result, edema is going to form around the terminal airways, which are compromised now and closed and now can be destroyed. Lung volume and compliance are then further reduced. As the fluid continues to leak in more of the lung areas, fluid, protein, and blood cells start collecting in the alveoli and in the spaces between the alveoli. Lymph channels are compressed and more fluid collects. Poorly inflated alveoli receive blood but cannot oxygenate it, increasing the shunt. So what results? Hypoxemia. Ventilation perfusion mismatch occurs. So that decrease in surfactant is very, very significant. So what are the signs and symptoms of ARDS or shock lung? And you do need to remember these extensively. There's quite a few select all that apply on this test. One of the things you're going to see is non-cardiac bilateral pulmonary edema. Remember, they're just coming in. All of a sudden, they got into some uh, trouble and are having issues and it's usually non-pulmonary, non-cardiac related. It's, it's because of the acute lung injury uh, that brought it on. They'll have what's called a dense pulmonary infiltrates or what we call the white out. And it talks about these on page 613 in your book under diagnostic assessment. It says the chest x-ray may show diffuse haziness or a whited out ground glass appearance of the lung. Okay, So it just looks like it's kind of all whited out when you look at it on the x-ray because of all the infiltrates. Of course they're going to be short of breath with increased respiratory rate. And in your book back um, a few chapters ago it talked about a dyspnea assessment in correlation with ADLs and that's on page 503. So let's just flip back to 503 real quick. Oh, and we will see a table 27-2 correlation of dyspnea with performance of ADLs and it classes it class 1 to class 5 and as you can imagine the more you go to class 5 the more sort of breath you get right so in a class 1 there's no restrictions enjoyable dyspnea only occurs on more than normal or strenuous activities so if you're looking at your ADLs, there's no breathlessness, everything's normal. On a class 5, on the other hand, they are entirely restricted to home. They get dyspnea even at rest. And the performance on their ADLs uh, would need to be total, total care because it's too difficult for them to perform without uh, help. If you'll remember the word orthopnea, it's down there in the blue below the table. This is shortness of breath occurring when lying down and is relieved by sitting up. And you will commonly see that uh, in patients who are having trouble breathing. Uh, of course, tachycardia, restlessness. We know restlessness, I remember, was a red flag uh, in children and one of the first red flags. Uh, that they're having hypoxemia, and we also see this in adults as well. One of the big things you're going to see is what's called refractory hypoxemia, and this is when a patient does not respond to high levels of oxygen 
even when it's up to 100%. So I do want you to read up on refractory hypoxemia, but I want you to know that this hypoxemia also persists for a while. It occurs mainly because the air sacs inside your lungs are now full of fluid. Remember, we just read the patho. Well, if they're full of fluid, that prevents inhaled oxygen from passing into the blood vessels that line the lung spaces. Oops, we're in trouble here. And enter the bloodstream. So would increasing the oxygen help if the blood vessels are not getting the oxygen to the lungs to start with? No. So you can sit there and increase it to 100% and it's never going to help until you fix the problem. Okay. Retractions are common. So you want to look for retractions, particularly intercostals and substernal. Um, when will you see signs and symptoms that we talked about and you need to know about of ARDS develop in a patient? So let's say someone's had um, an acute lung injury. Let's say they had shock, for example, one of the types of shock. When and they, are they most vulnerable of going into ARDS that I really need to be watching them? Well, it's within 24 to 48 hours. Oops, I need to be watching them. This is, fail, this is a major reason that patients uh, don't make it is failure to recognize. So if you have a patient who's come in with one of these common causes of acute lung injury, and as you can see here, the list is quite broad, then you want to be watching them the next 24 to 48 hours, particularly for signs and symptoms of ARDS. Okay? If they start getting short of breath, uh, respiratory rate increases, heart rate increases, restless, you're increasing the oxygen, but you're not seeing their oxygen level go up, starting to have retractions, big, big clues, okay? Red flags, as we would call them. So I have a question. Why is there no abnormal lung sounds on this list? Hmm, I see none. Well, if we look on page 613 in your book under details, under the patient-centered collaborative care assessment part, you will see in italics, abnormal lung sounds are not heard on auscultation because the edema occurs first in the interstitial spaces and not in the airways. Assess vital signs at least hourly for hypotension, tachycardia, and dysrhythmias. So you're really going to be watching for these signs and symptoms, not waiting until their lungs or you're hearing abnormal lung sounds because you will not hear those at first because the fluid is strictly in the interstitial spaces and not between the lung linings and not in the actual airways at first. Don't we want to catch this early? Absolutely. So you need to be the vigilant nurse who's always watching for these signs and symptoms. So the nursing priority is prevention of ARDS, right? I know that someone's come in with this. I know they're at risk for this. I know when they're at risk for it. I want to try to prevent it, right? So early recognitions of patients who are high risk, knowing those patients who may come in, who are at high risk, and then watching for those symptoms and reporting them immediately if they do occur. Now on page 614 in your book goes over the phases of ARDS, and you need to know these in the treatments, and what they center around. They have changed these. There used to be four phases. Now there are three phases. Okay, so now there are three phases. And treatment, treating the cause, prevents phase progression. So if someone's in phase one and you not recognize it and treat the cause, you'll prevent them from going from phase two to phase three. So you immediately want to try to reverse those uh, causes as soon as possible. And how do you do that? By following medical management and nursing management. And we'll talk about nursing management and focus on it. First, you got the exudative phase. This is when early changes of dyspnea tachypnea are occurring. You're starting to see someone getting more short of breath, tachycardic. Then early interventions need to start focusing immediately on supporting that patient. 
providing oxygen early on uh, before those lungs get to where they can't provide uh, the oxygenation to the uh, lungs, watching their pulse ox, watching their vital signs, keeping their head up, uh, I mean, just making sure that you're doing all you can, monitoring INO so that they don't get any extra fluids uh, to make matters worse. Phase two is the fibroprophylactic phase, and this is when you have increased lung damage. And in this phase, they get pulmonary hypertension and fibrosis. So the body's attempting now in this phase to repair some of that damage. MODS or multiple organ dysfunction syndrome can occur and that's often what gets people when they go into multi-system uh, organ failure. Um, interventions during this phase are going to be on delivering adequate oxygenation. Big things preventing complications from occurring and supporting the lungs and that may be particularly in this case mechanical ventilation which we'll talk about later. In the third phase is resolution. This is usually 14 days later, so about two weeks out from ARDS, either the patient's going to do one of a few things. Either they're going to be totally resolved because you fixed what they came in with, they're going to pass away, or it can become a chronic problem. Survivors that get past phase two, this uh, fibroprophylytic phase that have the chronic hyperten pulmonary hypertension and fibrosis, do survive, but they have very poor quality of life scores. They have lots of problems with ADLs and uh, other um, issues as they uh, continue with the disease process. So what's nursing management of ARDS? What are we going to do? Can we do anything? Yes. We are going to be watching respiratory effort continuously. Are they grunting? Are they getting cyanosis? Because cyanosis, we all know, is a late sign. It's an uh-oh. Pallor, retractions. Look at those lungs. Look at the abdomen. Look at the chest. Are they retracting? Preventing infections, giving good oral care, particularly if they're on the vent. Nutritional support. We all know that's important. Uh, tube feedings, parental nutrition. We've got to keep their body um, with protein and uh, keep it where it can heal itself. Optimizing oxygenation and ventilation. They may be on PEEP or CPAP, and we'll talk about those settings later. PEEP stands for positive in expiratory pressure, and CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure. You know some people who are on CPAP at night to help them breathe. What it does is give them a little bit of oop, extra oomph that opens those alveoli. Well, PEEP does the same thing. It just does it through a ventilator setting. Comfort, emotional support, very, very important. Collaboration with other members of the healthcare team. Phase four, or phase three, excuse me. Uh, I think I said phase four down here. It should be phase three. My bad. You want to prepare them for long term ventilation. Prepare them on long term ventilation. There's an article on home ventilation care, particularly uh, directed towards the PEDS and how ill prepared nurses are to take care of patients in the home setting on ventilators, particularly PEDS. Uh, and I think after reading that article, it'll almost scare you to death. So I do want you to read that article. There will be a general question over that. Um, and I, it's very important that you go over it. But that should say phase three. My bad. Medications. Well, they're going to be on steroids. And no, we don't just give them. We have to have an order. That's going to decrease white blood cell movement and stabilize the membrane. Because remember, a lot of this is inflammatory. And steroids will decrease that inflammation. But with the steroids comes the good, bad, and the ugly. We have to also watch their sugar levels, especially diabetics. They may get cushion-like syndromes, the abdominal stride, the purple stride, um, the buffalo hump. Um, uh, especially on the uh, shoulder areas, the extra padded areas, uh, the rounded moon face, and a decreased immunity. Uh, antibodies help fight the infection. Vitamin C and E help modify the inflammatory response and stress, so they may be on C and E supplements. Fluids are a big thing. 
Maintaining perfusion is very important. If you look on page 614 under evidence-based practice, less fluid is better. This is under the drug and fluid therapy part. It says, research shows that patients with ARDS who receive conservative fluid therapy have improved lung function and a shorter duration of mechanical ventilation and ICU length of stay compared with those who received liberal fluid therapy. So the conservative fluid therapy involves infusing smaller amounts of IV fluid and the use of diuretics to maintain fluid balance, whereas liberal fluid therapy often results in increasing positive fluid balance and even more edema. So the research now says very, very conservative on fluids, not liberal. And again, diuretics can decrease the lung edema. Do genetics play a role in the development of ARDS? And the answer is yes. If you look on page 613 under patient-centered care, it says, an increased genetic risk is suspected in the development and progression of ARDS. Variations in the genes responsible for surfactant production, uh oh, here's surfactant again, appear to increase the predisposition to developing ARDS, as does variation in the genes responsible for cytokine production during inflammatory events associated with sepsis. Ask about the patient's previous responses to infection and injury. If the patient has consistently had greater than expected inflammatory responses or autoimmune diseases, he or she can be at increased risk for ARDS after an acute lung injury and should be monitored for manifestations of the disorder. So that is something to keep in the back of your mind, very important. That could be a failure to rescue again. All right. So moving right along, if you have any questions about ARDS, let me know. By the way, do you remember when do the anterior fontanelles close? If your mind went to by 18 months, you are correct. When do the posterior fontanelles close? If your mind went to by six to eight weeks, you are correct. All right, so let's go over now fast fact sheets chest trauma. So we're going to skip some of this intubation and some of this stuff and come back to it. Chest trauma starts on page 622 in your book. It goes over pulmonary contusion, rib fractures, flail chest, and pneumothorax hemothorax. The initial emergency response to all chest injuries is A, B, C's followed by rapid assessment and treatment of life-threatening conditions. Now, I'm not saying breathing problems here. You know, I know we're doing our CABs now, but we are talking about chest injuries, and it's still ABCs. So the first one we're going to talk about is pulmonary contusion, and this one is the most common. This one occurs during rapid deceleration during motor vehicle accidents. And it's going to result in a three-step process. Number one, interstitial hemorrhage. That's in and between the alveoli, remember? In and between the alveoli. So we start hemorrhaging in and between the alveoli. This then leads to step two, edema, then decreased pulmonary compliance and reduces the area of gas exchange. Very similar to what? ARDS. It ends with hypoxemia and dyspnea, leading to respiratory failure over time if you don't do something. So what can these chest traumas lead to? ARDS. So if I've got my handy dandy nursing microscope out, or in this case magnifying glass, what am I going to be looking for when someone comes in after a pulmonary contusion? Hemoptysis. So what is hemoptysis? Coughing, coughing up or spitting up of blood. Decreased breath sounds. I listen and I just can't hardly hear anything on that side. 
Then I can also hear a lot of, I can get to where I hear crackle and wheezes. So it may be decreased in the bass and crackle and wheezes in the upper. So now I hear, now I've got a patient who had a motor vehicle accident. They have come in with a pulmonary contusion. They had rapid deceleration during this. They hit the tree and they went forward and they flung back. And a few hours later, now they're coughing up blood. They've got decreased breath sounds in the bases. I hear a few crackles. Then I'm probably going to have to do some stuff after the physician uh, is notified. The physician is going to focus on ventilation and oxygenation, and we are too as far as the oxygenation. They may also start monitoring uh, central venous pressure, um, fluid restrictions, less is more in this concept as well, less is more, so you want to try to restrict. And really the best thing you can do for a pulmonary contusion is rest, rest, rest. That allows time for healing. Now if they are in obvious respiratory distress, they may be needing to be put on mechanical ventilation with the PEEP that we talked about earlier to help inflate those lungs. So um, this is one of those things that rest is the best medicine, but they're also going to be monitoring uh, them to making sure they don't need to be having mechanical ventilation, monitoring cerebral uh, central venous pressure, we'll talk about how to do that later, and fluid restrictions. The second most common is rib fractures. Anybody ever had a rib fractures? Owie, owie, right? The etiology is usually a direct blunt trauma to the chest that usually involves ribs one through four, and it drives those bone ends usually into your thorax. So if we get out our handy dandy magnifying glass, what are we going to be looking for? Pain on movement, splinting of the chest, so they're barely moving, they're holding their uh, both sides of their ribs, reduced breath, breathing depth, they will start shadow breathing because they don't want to deep breathe, breathe deeply because it hurts. This can all lead to atelexis, which is a where the alveoli start collapsing and you can't get that full lung expansion. And spirometry is the best thing for that. And they can end up with pneumonia as well. Um, so what are we going to do? Well, Treatment depends, and no, not that kind. If it's uncomplicated, if there's no complications with the rib fractures, let's say they didn't poke anything, you just got some cracked ribs, then it's really non-pacific because the ribs usually reunite spontaneously. Now, years ago, we would wrap, wrap, wrap you up so tight you could barely breathe anyways, but that is no longer recommended. If other complications are present, pulmonary contusion, pneumothorax, then of course you're going to have more specific care, uh, particularly like a chest tube. Because remember now, the bone has went into the thorax area, so we're going to have to do something. The main focus of treatment uh, from a nursing perspective is going to be helping decrease that pain. Why? If they decrease pain, they're going to inhale deeper. If they inhale deeper, that's going to prevent complications, and we're all about preventing complications, right? Right. Now, can you have a poor diagnosis with rib fractures? Just because you have a rib fractures, uh, you end up with rib fractures, can you end up with a poor diagnosis? <coughs> and the answer is yes. If you're not careful, then you can end up with injuries um, that end up having uh, a poor prognosis. Uh, management um, can end up with, uh, you can end up going into respiratory depression and having all these other complications. So again, we're always about preventing, always looking for those signs and symptoms that tell us, hey, something's not right here. Now, flail chest is the last one that we're going to talk about. This is the inward movement of the, um, I'm sorry, it's not either, I lied. It's the third one we're going to talk about. It's the inward movement of the thorax during inspiration with outward movement during expiration. Hmm. 
That sounds backwards, because it is. It usually results from multiple rib fractures caused by blunt trauma, leaving a segment of the whole chest wall loose. You may see this in people who have had, who are older, who've had CPR and you break all their ribs. Um, this could occur. It results in, of course, gas exchange being impaired, uh, the ability to cough being impaired, uh, the ability to clear, clear secretions being impaired. So if you've got all these impaired, I see problems, don't you? So how do I know someone has this? What am I going to find with my magnifying glass when I get it out? One of the things is paradoxical chest movements, and that means opposite of what you would expect to see, backwards, right? Now, usually this occurs when you have at least three or more ribs that are broken in the anterior and posterior. And again, you just got that loose part hanging there. On page 623, shows you a good picture on figure 32-4. And if you see here, it shows the sucking inward of the loose chest area during inspiration and the puffing out of the same area during expiration. And that should be backwards. Now, I have a YouTube. It won't let me pull it up or it won't record this for me. So after the recording, I want you to go to this YouTube and you'll never forget what a flail chest looks like after watching that. Dyspnea, cyanosis, tachycardia, hypotension, pain, anxiousness are all signs and symptoms as well. But what would be the telltale one? Paradoxical chest movement. Because these are what? General signs and symptoms of anyone having chest trauma, correct? Yes, correct. So look for the paradoxical chest movement in something, someone with a flail chest. So how are we going to treat this? They're going to have to have oxygen, pain management, Anything that promotes lung expansion, okay? And in this case, they'll probably have to have chest tube. And we'll talk about, you're going to be talking extensively about chest tube in the fall. And it says coming soon to a lecture fall 2013. I don't know how I got that. should be fall 2016. I'm off a few years there. So uh, you'll be talking extensively about chest tubes uh, later on. I know some of being LPNs should have had some experience uh, with chest tubes. Uh, promotion of lung expansion, uh, suctioning, possible mechanical ventilation during healing if it's too bad. And occasionally they have to go in there and do surgery and actually rewire all of the ribs back in place. And that is no fun, long recovery. All right, the last one is pneumothorax and hemothoraxes. Pneumothoraxes are caused by blunt trauma again. They can be open, and if they're considered open, that means the pleural cavity is exposed to outside air, or they can be closed, <coughs> and that results in decreased breath sounds. Hyperresonance, pain, pleuratic pain, it hurts to take a deep breath in, dyspnea, I think I spelled that wrong. Dyspenia. This should be dyspnea. And sub Q emphysema. Now that's where air gets under the skin in the subcutaneous tissues. And it looks like bubble wrap. And it sounds like bubble wrap. You can, they just get these big air pockets under their uh, subcutaneous tissue. And you can actually push on them and they will kind of do like bubble wrap. Uh, they will eventually soak back in. The air will, but it will take a little bit. Uh, and you may also see deviation of the trachea. That's away from the, it's usually deviated away from the affected side if it's closed and towards the affected side if it's open. So if you're looking at the devia, if you're looking at the trachea and they came in with right-sided blunt trauma, okay, right-sided blunt trauma, and it's deviated away from the affected side, so it's going to the left, then I know it's closed. If it's going towards the right, the side that the trauma is on, then I know that it's open. It's affecting that side because it's deviating towards the injury. Treatment is chest tube. And again, coming to a respiratory lecture, fall 2016. Stay tuned. Hemothorax. Now, this is caused by blunt trauma or penetrating injury. 
Usually 1,500 meals of loss is considered simple and more than 15 is considered massive. Fine line there. You go from simple to massive really quick. Bleeding into the pleural space because of injury of the lung tissue. You want to look for shortness of breath, decreased breath sounds, and blood being visible on the x-ray. Treatment, anterior and posterior chest, chest tubes. An open thoracotomy may have to be performed if large amounts of blood loss. And of course, blood transfusions. So with blood transfusions comes review. Um, there are four main types of blood transfusions. And you need to review these on your own. You've had these several times already, right? Acute hemolytic occur within the first 15 minutes. Usually, you've got the wrong blood type. Signs and symptoms. Uh, one of the first things you'll see is what? Severe plank pain, especially in the kidney area. Because why? Those red blood cells are lysising and breaking down and jamming in capillaries. And the kidneys are one of the first capillaries to become clogged, so you start feeling pain back there. Feeling of impending doom, shortness of breath, um, all of those. Diaphoresis, what are you going to do? Stop the transfusion, change out the saline, and notify the physician. Leftovers go to the lab. That's why we stay with our patient for the first full 15 minutes because we want to make sure we're in the room if this acute hemolytic reaction occurs. Febrile reactions, if you remember, mainly occur within the first 30 minutes to an hour. <clears throat> febrile reactions, those who are at most at risk for those who receive multiple transfusions because they are having reactions to multiple people's white blood cells. Uh, a lot of times the physician may either slow down or stop it for 30 minutes, give them Tylenol, and restart it once uh, the fever starts coming down. They can also put on what's called a white blood cell filter and filter out the white blood cells so that they uh, do not cause issues. Um, allergic reactions, usually that's to some of the preservatives or something uh, that's in the actual blood product itself, and you would expect to see signs and symptoms of allergic reaction, right? Wheels, wheezing, all those things. And of course, you would stop the reaction. You would stop the transfusion, change out the saline, notify the physician, and leftovers to lab. And then fluid volume overload. Of course, we want to make sure that we are giving this over the allotted time, particularly if this is an elderly person, particularly if this is an elderly person with cardiac issues. If it's a young person with cardiac issues, you don't want to infuse it. Uh, you've got four hours to hang it, and you need to do it over four hours. You need to, again, um, start the transfusion at no more than 25 mils during the first 15 minutes. Uh, and if they tolerate that, then you can increase it to around 100 mils, 125, and that will get it in the allotted time. Because most bags are about 350 to 400 uh, mils in the bag. So watch for signs and symptoms of fluid volume overload. If you see it, you want to know the physician. Notify the physician. A lot of times they will give Lasix before or between if they're getting more uh, than one uh, unit. All right, that brings us to mechanical ventilation. I will do this in part two. So we're halfway there, page six of page 12. So if you have any questions or concerns about anything I talked about so far, let me know. Thank you very much.